So by way of uh, context, we um, at EDUS uh, did a divestment campaign or have run a divestment campaign with the support of Sainsbury's Family Charitable Trust for the last four years. Well, we started that work with people on planet four years ago. Already four universities are committed to divest their endowments from fossil fuels, four UK universities. And now we're at about 70, so we're about halfway mark now. It's been really successful. Um, um, we did some freedom of information requests. We published the data. We support students' union presidents to ask questions of their vice chancellors. And one by one, universities are being committed to divest their endowments. At the beginning of that work, um, and I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so I'm just going to mute your mic and then you'll have to okay, unmute sure. if you want to talk. At the beginning of that work, we did some freedom of information requests of universities and found uh, we got about uh, about half of all universities responded and we found about a billion pounds worth of endowments of which a hundred million were invested directly in fossil fuels. We think because quite a few of the more well-off uh, Oxford and Cambridge colleges didn't apply, we actually think the total's in, in the order of about 3.5 billion. And assuming that 10% of the figure's right, um, then we, we think that there's going to be something like 350 million pounds invested in fossil fuel companies. So assuming we've moved or got the commitments to move about half of that total out of fossil fuels, then um, we've managed to move quite a bit of money out of the industry. The problem we have with that campaign is that's the money, that's the endowment money in listed equities, shit stocks and shares, if you like. Um, and they're moving it from stocks and share pots, which are generally with big companies like BlackRock and other investment funds, um, with some in fossil fuels to similar pots uh, with sometimes the same fund managers without the fossil fuels. Whereas that is kind of what we wanted to happen when we started divestment four years ago. The problem is it's still in the likes of BT and British Airways and Tesco. It's not really, you know, universities are, exist to serve the public good, they're charities. And these companies aren't necessarily aligned with that public good um, because, because of the, you know, the nature of their, their business models. And it made us think, oh, we're going to have to run a divestment campaign because people are investing in Amazon and then you know, workers' rights, or we'll have to invest in a divestment campaign because they're in high carbon industries. So basically, the point we got to was thinking, why don't we just move the money out of listed equity pots and put it into specific investment vehicles that invest in renewables? And we approached a lot of the companies that already do that, including Foresight, as part of that initial freedom of information request piece so that we could come up with a positive investment briefing, which is on our website still. And uh, coincidentally, Eleanor from Foresight got hold of us about a year ago and said, how are we getting on with the work? And is it worth us having a chat? And um, they, they uh, I'll, I'll let Eleanor say a bit more about what they do in a moment, but um, they're one of a number of companies that specifically invest in renewables. And we were thinking that that's the sort of investment opportunity which uh, universities could move their money into. Um, and we're thinking if we could move the three and a half billion on um, on the back of a sort of a, a fag packet, Henry from um, Foresight suggested that would be enough to power 1.8 million homes if it was put into new renewables or take 1.9 million cars off the UK roads. So there's a considerable amount of money that we have as, as our in our um, in our institutions. And, you know, the IPCC say we need two things pretty urgently. One is more renewables, less fossil fuel burning. Uh, and the second one is more trees. So, you know, this is to tackle the first one predominantly. And the call next week is for the second one. Um, the alternative model of putting it into pots uh, that invest in, renew in renewables, it could be a mix of established renewables or uh, new build renewables but of course if it's established renewables and you're buying into it it just means that money can be redeployed into yet more renewables without having the sometimes hassle of having to go through all the planning permissions to get your own renewable set up of course there's a very good case for building renewables if you've got land and universities shouldn't be put off from doing that and there's lots of uh, organizations out there that might be interested in talking to individual institutions that have got land and money and want to do some impact investing of their own but I suppose this call, I wanted to focus on the easier model, which is instructing your investment managers, finance directors, whoever it might be, to move the money out of listed equity pots, which typically return sort of 6 to 8% return on investment each year over to 
something which gives a similar return, but simply invest in renewable assets instead. So um, I think the way we'll do it, Ellen, if I could ask um, your any of your colleagues just to say a little bit about, and I'll put your slides up about um, the sort of offering you've got, which I've, I think I've already circulated around to a few people anyway. And then at the end, we'll take some questions and comments from people. And the questions and comments can come in at any point, I should say, um, in the chat box if you want to pop them in. Is that right, Helena? I'll, uh, I'll unmute you and then you can talk again. Oh, Helena, sorry, I don't think we can hear you now. I have unmuted you, I think. Grant, Grant, can you hear them? Hmm, that's strange. You were on before. It says you're unmuted, but I can't quite hear you at the moment. Yeah, I'm the same. I can't hear them either. It's all right. Do you, you sort yourselves out while I get your slides uh, slides up on the screen. No, still can't hear you. Sorry. Um, the other way you could do it, Alan, is if you leave the call and then just dial back in, sometimes it, it resets things. Well, I just, uh, I'm just going to share my screen with everyone and then we'll get the... Um, the four side slides on. So I'm going to share my desktop, so you'll you'll need to accept. Can, can you hear us now? We've just tried something else. Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Clear, yeah. So for, for everybody else, we need to accept my share screen, and then you'll be able to hopefully see the slides. Grant, I'm using you as my is this working person for this call. Can you see the first slide on now? You're on mute, I think, so I don't know if you said yes or no. I put my thumb on oh, Sorry. Great. OK, perfect. Um, so, Jamie, as I said, happy to, to give a quick introduction to four sides as a group, and then we can walk through some of the slides in step. But is it helpful just for us to give a very brief introduction in terms of who's on the line from Foresight Group and what we do here? Yes, please. Perfect. So just kicking off with myself. So my name is Elena Palasner. I'm the senior manager in the institutional capital team here at Foresight Group. And um, my team focused on capital raising and investor relations for our various institutional platforms at Foresight Group. Um, so I've been at Foresight for just over six years um, and I previously spent three years at Morgan Stanley on the equity sales side. And then we also have Dan Wells in the room and, and my colleague Henry Morgan on the line and I'll let them just briefly introduce themselves. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Dan Wells. I'm uh, I, I'm, I'm a partner in the um, the infrastructure and real assets team, as, as Elena mentioned here at Foresight. Uh, I've got um, uh, around 20 years of experience in the uh, kind of in, in the sector, as it were, um, and the sector there being um, uh, investment management focused on sustainability themes. I, I, I decided very early in my career to to focus on. Um, on sustainability within um, within fund management. Uh, I first worked at EY in London for around seven years in an advisory uh, capacity, so advising governments and corporates, first of all on, on kind of conventional energy, oil and gas, nuclear, um, and then um, I completed a part-time degree in sustainability and focused on clean energy uh, strategies after that. Um, in 2007, I, I left EY and, and joined a small team of three other people that had spun out of uh, Numura, um, the, the Japanese bank, um, and we put together a new um, investment management firm called Syndicatum uh, that was focused on clean energy and sustainable um, forestry and other natural resource investment themes, and I spent two years in the US primarily uh, raising capital, um, raised capital from a number of institutional investors. Um, but also a number of university endowments, um, including uh, the University of Texas, um, Duke University, and uh, the University of Minnesota. Um, uh, and then I spent um, uh, around uh, just under four years um, uh, in Asia, um, uh, overseeing the, the deployment of that fund into a number of clean energy and natural resource uh, projects. Um, I, I, I joined um, uh, Foresight in, um, uh, in 2012 um, uh, and the evolution of the firm um, since then um, within our infrastructure programme has been to, uh, to start by kind of saying what are the technologies we think is being disruptive in the clean energy world, which at the time were primar primarily solar and uh, bioenergy, um, moving towards um, the, the, the model of the business as it is today, which is to invest in 
um, in all aspects of, of the kind of new and clean energy system um, and, and beyond that um, in, in other um, forms of what we would deem to be real assets, but with a sustainability led uh, focus. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but I'll, I'll hand over to, uh, to, to, to Henry to give, to give his introduction. Assuming that is that Henry is not suffering from the same meat, meat issues that we, we have. What I might do, maybe, so maybe we should just carry on. We'll carry on. Um, and Henry can just jump in um, uh, as and when. So, Jamie, if you wouldn't mind just uh, turning to, to slide three of that deck. Um, and I'll just kick off with a very brief introduction as Foresight is a group. Um, so, Foresight was founded over 30 years ago, uh, and we today manage just over £4 billion pounds worth of AUM. Um, of that £4 billion, pounds, 90% of that is invested into our clean energy infrastructure platform. Uh, that's into, invested into a portfolio of around 190 clean energy assets globally, um, which have a renewable generation of over 2 gigawatts. Um, as Dan mentioned in the past, we've been active in two areas in particular. So we've been very active in the solar space, so manage around 1.2 gigawatts of solar assets globally. Uh, of that, the majority is within Europe, so we manage the second largest solar portfolio in Europe, um, but we were also early entrants into the Australian solar market in 2017, um, and now manage one of the larger portfolios uh, in that region as well. Um, aside from solar, we've also been very active in the bioenergy or, or waste energy space, um, so we manage a number of institutional mandates on behalf of the former UK's Green Investment Bank, um, now known as the GIG. Uh, and also the European Investment Bank. Um, and those mandates have been investing into mainly UK waste energy. So we've acquired over 30 assets um, across a range of different feedstocks and technology types, um, and are seen as kind of one of the real leaders uh, in that space. Aside from uh, solar and bioenergy, we've also recently um, amassed a portfolio of onshore wind assets uh, and also hydro assets as well. Uh, and then as Dan mentioned over the past kind of three to five years, we've really started to look at not just renewable generating assets, but also all the new energy infrastructure that's needed to support the intermittent nature of renewables. So I've made our first investments into things such as battery storage, for example, uh, and, and gas peaking engines or, or reserve power. In terms of the types of funds we manage, um, so we manage both retail and institutional money. That's split around 20% retail, 80% institutional. On the institutional side, we manage 15 infrastructure funds, uh, and that's a real range of different types of funds from kind of your very typical LPGP funds um, to our large listed yield codes, of which we manage to uh, the listed on the London Stock Exchange uh, and everything in between. So we also manage a number of strategic managed accounts on behalf of specific investors, so a large UK corporate pension fund uh, and also some South Korean investors as well. Um, but very used to working with, with large institutions and, and local authority pension schemes um, across those different types of mandates. I guess one other point just to note um, from the slides, you'll see there that we have 89 infrastructure professionals at Foresight Group. Uh, I think that's just important to highlight because that splits around 50-50 investment professionals to asset management professionals. Um, so we take a very active hands-on approach to our asset management, so manage all those assets in-house and have very large and experienced teams of people like engineers, um, legal assistants, finance professionals, for example. Uh, we think that's a real benefit to investors in terms of the long-term ongoing management of their assets as well as um, the financial optimization. I might just hand over to Dan then, who can go on to the next slide, so slide four, and he can just walk through how we see the, the sector and how we uh, believe we are differentiated in the sector compared to other managers. Thanks, Elena. Um, so, so, so what Elena's done is kind of set out what Foresight Group is in terms of the numbers. Uh, so um, what, what, what does that mean? How, how do you think about us kind of in the universe of fund managers? Um, we are we are a mid-sized manager, so we're 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 not we're not as big as, as the kind of black rocks of this world, um, but we're glow, we're growing we're growing rapidly, uh, uh, and we're growing because of a very focused approach that we have adopted uh, over the last uh, the last few years in particular. And the the things we try and emphasise when we when we describe ourselves um, uh, are, are a small number of, of kind of core differentiators. There's five that are set out on the slide here. I'm only going to focus on three of them, which, are, which really are the core of what we do at Foresight. Um, and and the, the first one, which really, which really captures boxes one and two, is that we say we are sustainability-led in our approach. 
Um, and what we mean by that is that when we start, um, when we set our investment programs at the very inception, we, we, we look at the long-term trends that are shaping the world and society and we wrap our investment programs around that. Decarbonisation of the, of, of, the, of the power system, uh, which is a, a specific thing, but obviously a, a, a really core component of, of, of addressing the overall sustainability challenge, is something that we have been primarily focused on uh, for the last 10 years, really. Um, and, and that's obviously what we're, we're talking about today. Um, and we've built a really deep expertise in that, and, and we are one of the global leaders in, in, in investing in, in new and clean energy um, systems. But we look at other complementary um, trends shaping society. Uh, and last year, for example, we set up a, a working group to look at opportunities that will be um, emerging in the sustainable land and food uh, space. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and what we mean by that is, is everything from um, sustainable agricultural practices, uh, such as regenerative agriculture, uh, sustainable forestry, um, uh, and, uh, and, and in fact, new, new methods of agricultural production, uh, such as controlled environment food production. Uh, so using anything from, from polytunnels or greenhouses to, to, to fill on vertical farms to produce crops in a, um, in, in a more sustainable manner. Um, and one of the key things we're, we're, we're picking up at the minute is that there's a huge amount of appetite for the institutional investors that we work with for these kind of assets that, that, that um, are producing steady cash flows, uh, that are backed by um, low volatility, uh, long-term contracts, they're asset backed, and they're just producing something that, that people want, i.e. sustainable products, whether it's energy or, or, or food. So what, 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 what we are, and the reason we describe ourselves as sustainability-led is all about um, looking to create value and to manage risk. We, we, we think that it's impossible to invest in the long term uh, or with long-term horizons without having a fundamental understanding of, of, of sustainability themes. And in that respect, we see absolutely no trade-off between financial returns and, um, uh, and sustainability, quite the reverse, actually. Um, uh, we see it fundamental to our approach. I think the second thing to emphasize about our approach and how we think about sustainability is that we, we kind of think that whatever organization you are, including ourselves, you need to go through a, a sequence of steps when implementing a, a, a sustainability policy or a sustainable investment policy. And that sequence is, first of all, thinking about your objective. What, what are you trying to achieve by thinking about sustainability or ESG or impact or whatever you want to call it? For us, the objective is very clear and it's at the bottom of the slide. Our objective is uh, our relentless commitment to um, uh, essentially to making great long-term real assets investments. Um, and then the kind of second part of the, the, the process then is once you've got your objective, you, objectives, you can then design your, your, your business around that. Um, so first of all, setting your own definitions for the terminology here. We have, we have our own definitions for the key terms. We tend to talk about sustainability rather than ESG for reasons we, we, we could expound on. We just find it a more useful term. A more useful term. Um, we then, and we, we think it's always necessary then to have clear sustainability values embedded in the organisation, um, which drive both kind of high level behaviours, but also then specific kind of practical tools um, uh, that help us um, uh, analyse and make decisions, factoring in uh, the non-financial aspects or the sustainability aspects of the investments. Um, and that's where, for example, we've developed the, um, uh, what we call the sustainability evaluation criteria which is a very simple tool that allows us to kind of say, okay, what's good and what's bad about a potential investment? And we'll talk that through in a minute. So that, that's the first component of us, that our kind of sustainability-led um, uh, nature. The second thing we emphasize is the third is, um, and I know I'm confusing you here with the boxes, but the, th the third box, um, which is our, what we call kind of conscious portfolio construction. Um, and what we're doing here is um, it's common practice within infrastructure investing uh, to look to diversify the portfolio as much as possible. Um, uh, and, and that's great because it reduces risk. We look to go beyond that, really, um, and to put not just non-correlated assets together, but, but negatively correlated assets as well. Assets that are complementary, that, that kind of that, that overall have a positive effect for the, for the portfolio. And there's two dimensions to, to, to taking this approach. The first, or, or two reasons for doing this. The first is that it increases our overall risk adjusted return. And the second is that it, it, um, it creates, in our view, um, a stronger impact consequence. We're able to generate more positive impact in terms of sustainability because of taking this. 
and, and I'll, I'll give an example of this to, to explain what I mean. In the, um, in the, in the energy world, um, as um, Elena has alluded to, um, we think that the, the, the new energy system essentially needs three components to it. Uh, it needs generating assets, obviously, wind and solar, um, but those generating assets are both variable in their output and they're distributed in terms of where they're located. So um, we don't have this kind of simple system now of centralized large scale generation. We have a system where generation assets are spread out much more in the grid. Consumers themselves may have on site um, solar production, for example. And obviously, we're, we're, we're moving to a world where those production assets are cited where the resources, i.e. where the wind or the solar is, which is not necessarily the same place as to where, they, where the demand for the energy is. So what that means is that, that there's really these three baskets of, of assets that we need to invest in to decarbonize the, the energy system. And it's not just renewables. Renewables are only one element of them. It's, it's the renewable, um, uh, renewable generating assets, basket one. Basket two is what we call flexibility assets. So the assets required to accommodate the variable profile of renewables, and that's things like batteries, grid scale batteries, for example. And the third basket is, um, is all the poles and the wires that are, that are needed to connect this, this, this new system up. And, and, and of course, the funny thing is we talk a lot about smart grids and, and data and technology and things like blockchain. At the end of the day, the system is still currently built on wooden poles and copper wires largely. Um, so there's a whole kind of um, rewiring of the grid that's needed. So the reason for doing this is that, first of all, um, uh, it increases our risk adjusted return. What do I mean by that? Well, by putting complementary assets together, so wind and solar together, they work well together because they're negatively correlated in terms of when they output. Putting wind and solar and batteries together, again, they work well together for reasons I, I could kind of unpack later if people wanted details on. Um, so that, 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 that taking risk out of the equation um, in finance terms, by definition, increases the risk adjusted return. And then from an impact point of view, if we want to drive through this energy transition, we need investment in all three of those baskets. And, and in some places, it's not, a, it's not a need of renewables that's holding up the, um, uh, the, the energy transition. There's plenty of wind and solar that's available, and wind and solar um, in particular are now outcompeting um, uh, other energy sources um, in most places across the, across the globe. But in many places, it's a need for more flexibility or more grid assets in any given location. We've just seen in the UK over the last month a clear example uh, of the need for more flexibility in the, in the UK system uh, and the head of National Grid has made statements about the need for more batteries. Uh, with, with Foresight we are a leading investor in grid scale batteries in the UK and actually our batteries did play some role in helping to, uh, to minimise the impacts of the blackout last month. Um, but elsewhere, uh, and to take some random examples, in places like Texas that in the US where there's been a huge build out of wind it's actually now the local grid that's kind of holding back further deployments in, in, in many places. So there's opportunities to invest in the grid. So what this means is that if you want to drive um, a better risk adjusted return and if we want more impact, we think it's important not just to think in terms of being an investor in renewables, but the whole kind of spectrum of new energy. And that, 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 that whole approach of kind of conscious portfolio construction, that applies um, uh, to to, to, to other assets as well. So thinking about how we put energy assets in future together with, uh, say, large scale um, greenhouses or vertical farms that are producing sustainable, um, uh, sustainable food stuff. The last piece of what we try to kind of articulate about us and what we do, which is unique, is with the last box, um, which is what we call active asset management. Um, really what we mean here is, is just we are a kind of investor who rolls up our sleeves and we invest um, uh, uh, with um, a, a large team and we have a lot of in-house expertise, not just in the financial sense of, of being fund managers kind of sat in an office with, with spreadsheets, but, but having teams of internal engineers, of commercial people, uh, of people that negotiate contracts um, with, for example, farmers um, or landowners that, that own the land that, that we size our assets on. When we talk about asset management here, therefore, what we're talking about is not um, financial asset management, but asset management in the kind of physical operational sense. We have um, now, um, uh, as Elaine has mentioned, in fact, close to 100 people purely dedicated to new and clean energy investing, um, which includes the, the investment professionals, the finance people, um, it includes um, the engineers, uh, it includes our sustainability people like, like Henry, who have focused full time on, on, on sustainability and the sustainable footprint of all of our assets. 
That's a particularly important point now, um, because what we've seen in the last um, maybe two or three years in particular is something that really took us and everyone by surprise, which is that the, the speed and momentum of the emergence of, of, of unsubsidized renewables, I um, uh, kind of, I think probably moving it you know, from 2015 onwards, um, when we went through this inflection point of, of renewables starting to uh, outcompete other, uh, other sources of generation, to today where we see in many areas that we operate in, in particular, say investing in solar in Spain or in wind in, in the Nordic region, um, renewables now work without government subsidies. That's great and it's fantastic um, in terms of um, both sustainability and for us in terms of deal flow, but it does mean we need to um, be more hands-on in our approach because the, the old world of investing in assets that had government subsidies was kind of easier in some ways, um, in that these assets all look the same, though I had a long-term contract with the government. Now we have to put in place those contracts. We have to put in place the contract to sell the power, for example. So I'm going to pause there, because hopefully that's given uh, um, an overview of um, our and, and, our, and our approach. Um, uh, and, and obviously we're, we're happy to, to go into any of these points and, and happy to go into the detail of the energy system and how we think about sustainability. Um, so just to pause, does anyone have any um, questions at this point? I, I can't see the chat box because obviously I'm presenting the screen. So there might be uh, questions in the chat box. But if not, what I propose we do, Alan, is if you just if we just scoot on to the slide that talks about the specific £100 million fund that we've developed with you. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then sort of wrap up the presentation. We'll have a nice 25 minutes then for a chat and questions with people. Yeah, of course. Um, so that's slide 10 I think you're, you're talking about, Jamie. Do you want me to skip on to that one? Yeah, if you would like to. Yeah. Um, and then we can take any questions and touch upon any the rest of these. Also, we can circulate this deck after the call and um, go through any of the slides in, in more detail over email or phone if, if needed. Um, but in terms of, of what's outlined on slide 10, so this is off the back of a conversation, as Jamie mentioned, we've been having for the past kind of eight months to a year and of how we think we can help university endowments um, get an exposure to more renewable or clean energy infrastructure within their portfolio as an alternative to um, some of the equity funds that Jamie mentioned that may have exposure to um, coal or oil, for example. Um, so this is very much a kind of initial thinking. Uh, we thought very carefully in terms of the size of the market and uh, the size of fund that would not only provide enough diversification in terms of assets for endowments, but also also um, a size that we think we could come to be deploy. So, so you'll see there that the initial fund size is, is 100 million. Um, and we would, we've been having conversations with, with Jamie and a number of other universities in terms of, of whether they would like to come into this fund as, as kind of first investors. What I would say, and it's outlined on that slide, is, is we would look to seed this fund with a seed portfolio. Um, so I mentioned that Foresight manages a number of funds. Um, some of those funds have assets that they may be looking to exit over the next kind of six months to one year, which could provide a seed portfolio to this fund and therefore uh, the ability to deploy capital and generate yield for investors from day one. Um, we will be targeting assets smaller than 25 million. Um, we've seen a healthy pipeline of those, and as I mentioned, um, both in the UK and Europe and other regions in which we operate. Uh, and we will be targeting a, a net return to investors of, of 6%, which I understand is, is kind of in line with the endowment uh, targets as well. Um, Jamie, I don't know if there's anything else you want to touch on this slide. We would set it up as, as a limited partnership, so an LPGP fund. Um, we understand this is a, a structure that most endowments uh, are familiar with. <clears throat> However, we do, as I mentioned, not manage a number of different types of vehicles uh, and can be flexible in terms of structure in order to, to best work with, with investors on, on that side of things. Thanks. And, uh, and, um... Thanks as well, Dan, for that really useful overview and some of the, some of the ways you invest and what you invest in. Uh, just to say what NUS's involvement has been on. Um, Ella, do you think you could? I'm just getting a bit of feedback. Do you think you could just mute your? In fact, I can stop sharing the slide, and I can probably do it for you now. Actually, and I'll, I'll unmute you in a minute when. Um, oh, you, yeah, there we go. So I don't get the feedback from your speakerphone. Um, just to say a little bit about um, NUS's involvement. So, um, we're looking to have one or two or three of these sort of offerings from probably different companies because the problem with us just recommending Foresight is obviously we're not financial advisors and you need to be registered and all that sort of stuff to be a financial advisor. But we're after the principle that they move money out of standard, bog standard, off-the-shelf investment options 
uh, uh, packages from the likes of BlackRock, you know, these big transnational companies into specific investments to move the money into renewables so we can build more renewables, uh, of which this is a lovely um, bespoke version for universities of the UK. And in our experience, university finance directors or special investment types that work for the universities, very often they're external fund managers. They tend to sort of be a bit like sheep in the ever herd mentality. So um, that's why we were thinking we'd find a number of progressive universities who could jump in as this with as founder investors. NUS has got our own small endowment of half a million pounds, so we thought we might be a founder investor too. In terms of um, just the, for transparency purposes, uh, we're not going to get NUS is not going to get any money out of promoting any of these funds. What we have said to Foresight, and we'll say to the others that hopefully will come along and offer things as well, is it would be great if there could be an educational element in there so that universities can really get behind the fact that university money is being invested in something of benefit to society. And that might be, uh, as Foresight have suggested, a small amount of the money is ring-fenced and put back into new PhDs or subsidising scholarships or master students to actually make the case for more of this sort of work uh, or to investigate things related to renewables. Um, so they are really keen there's an educational element. Just the other thing I wanted to throw in is at the moment, obviously all your alumni teams go out and ask uh, your alumni for money for the university. And that's how these endowments are built up over time. An endowment is a gift to the university which can't be spent as such. It just can provide an investment which gives some return uh, that you can spend. And I think actually, this is one of the things that will really help this take off. There's a really nice ask for your alumni. You know, if we're going to build some wind turbines in the North Sea, are they going to be the university's wind turbines as they're seeing? It's a lovely new offer to go out to the alumni and say, well, we need another million quid uh, to add to our endowment to build another three or four wind turbines or whatever it might be. And that way, we'll hopefully it'll be a bit like a blue Peter totalizer. We'll get up to that 100 million quite quickly. Um, and then after that, you know, it might go up further so um, basically we want to see as much of that three and a half billion that we know of taken out of stocks and shares on the stock exchange and put into new renewable technology or um, as Dan says you know the infrastructure that makes those renewables work so at that point I think well I can see there's some questions and comments in the box it would be good um, uh, to chew through some of those and you can either pop questions in the box or just come off mute um, and speak. Um, the first question is uh, from um, David Chapman. He says, is that just green waste to energy? I think that might be in relation to something, um, Dan, you said around uh, energy to f uh, fuel or, or something. Shall I just unmute you and you can say a bit about that? Uh, are you off on mute again? I think you've got to do your special trick, Eleanor, whatever you did last time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, green waste to energy. Uh, so, I, I, I'm not sure exactly um, where, when I was talking, uh, which, which, where that question refers to. But just to give you an overview of of what we mean um, in terms of waste to energy. Um, uh, so, we we uh, we invest in and we have invested in kind of all types of, of bioenergy. Um, so, energy from municipal solid waste, um, uh, um, um, the waste uh, coming from farms, um, uh, going into anaerobic digestion um, uh, plants, so essentially uh, manure going into, into those. Um, also wood waste uh, that's going into large biomass plants. Um, so it's a range of different um, forms of, of, of waste to energy. We have also invested in, in um, in waste management, so waste kind of recycling plants, um, which obviously is an important part of, of, the, of the overall kind of green infrastructure world, um, but, but not producing energy. The vast majority of what we've done are, are, are energy production assets. Um, uh, our, our waste to energy business goes back to the work we did with the UK Green Investment Bank. Um, and we were one of the first two investment managers to be awarded uh, mandates from the Green Investment Bank um, and that was invested into a number of funds uh, over the last uh, the last uh, ten years. Um, European Investment Bank is also a major investor in our in our waste to energy um, funds. And overall, we've deployed about a billion pounds of capital um, uh, into waste to energy projects. 
the majority of that has been in the UK, uh, and we'll come on in a second to the, to the next question, which is regarding our, our kind of um, geographical um, breakdown of, of, of our assets under management. Um, uh, we have also invested in uh, waste to energy in, uh, in, in, in Germany, so in anaerobic digestion. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and and in fact, we look at we look at bioenergy assets across Europe. We have also looked at bioenergy assets and waste to energy assets in, in the US as well. I think as um, as a general comment, uh, we see waste to energy and bioenergy um, as so. So just to be clear about the distinction there, bioenergy also takes into account you know where you're. Where you've got dedicated plantations that are providing kind of um, feedstock for plants, we see these as, as um, this sector as a, as an important um, component of the of the energy transition. Um, it doesn't quite have the kind of universality of wind and solar. What I mean by that is that really there are three technologies that are fundamentally changing the world of energy: wind, solar, and batteries, and they are ubiquitous. Um, uh, and they will they will be more so across the world, and they're kind of driving all markets because obviously they 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 now work at, at such scale. Waste to energy typically is is more suited to specific localized conditions where there's a specific waste stream. So it might be manure from a chicken plant, for example, that otherwise is just is literally going to waste or or is creating kind of localized issues. Um, so so bioenergy is a bit more. Um, uh, Kind of um, a bit more localized, I would say. No, Dan, then about Dan, you... Dan, can Sorry. I just say, um, David, then clarified, are you moving away from general waste to energy to biomass? And obviously, they have their own emission issues. Um, so, yeah, they just clarified this question there for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so we, we are, we're, we're not consciously shifting away from waste to energy to, um, uh, to biomass. Um, what, what waste to energy? Whether it's municipal solid waste um, uh, um, uh, or biomass, yes, they all have um, uh, emissions um, issues. Obviously, we have to think about clearly the the feedstock, so where the where the fuel is coming from. If there's any um, issues regarding kind of food versus fuel, um, i.e., that that feedstock could have been used for something else, we we tend not to invest in those kind of assets. It's only assets where the um, uh, the um, the, the feedstock is a genuine waste stream that, that, that we'll be investing from it. Yeah, th thanks, Dan. The, on that as well, I should say, we reflected some of the conversations we had with um, uh, Dave uh, Gorman up at Edinburgh, uh, who, who contemplated being one of the founder investors in this. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on it, but basically, there's the opportunity for us to shape this fund into what renewables we want. So if we don't want to do anything um, along the lines of waste into fuel, and it could just be a solar fund, it could just be a, um, a wind fund. But with the view that finance people like, as you said at the beginning, Dan, a diverse portfolio, because it reduces the risk. But there is an opportunity to shape this fund into what people want it to be um, as the founder investors in that fund, isn't there? So, so I think there's, there's definitely the opportunity to, to have that conversation. Um, so when you circulate the deck, um, Jamie, there's a bit more information on some of the slides into kind of our suggested asset mix. I think when we were having a discussion with Edinburgh, they were particularly worried about investing into um, kind of wood chippings to energy plants. So um, that was something they said that they wouldn't be able to get past their investment committee. And we talked through the fact that there would potentially be some kind of way in the legal documents where we could exclude them from any types of those investments if they were to go ahead. Um, so there's definitely ways to work around it if there's certain technologies or, or um, assets that, that investors wouldn't want any exposure to. Yeah, yeah, I'd absolutely yeah, emphasize that point. I mean, we, we, we can tailor this to um to people's needs. And and I think from the at a high level in terms of waste of energy, um uh, whether the fuel stock is biomass or elsewhere, there's really two things to think carefully about. First of all, the, the kind of sustainability issues regarding the feedstock. Um we do spend a lot of time on that and the funds that we invest um into these assets have very strict criteria about what we will and won't do. Um, so, for example, um, the funds that the EIB have invested in have got um, very long schedules to the limited partnership agreements, which give very tight um, parameters on what will be a kind of qualifying um, uh, bio, bioenergy or, or waste to energy asset for, from a sustainability standpoint. 
The other consideration is just that these assets are quite hard to do. Um, uh, if things can go wrong with them, you have to be very hands-on. If something goes wrong with anaerobic digestion, um, a plant, then that plant can go down for a, for a while um, and the tanks need to be drained, etc. We do kind of know what we're doing in this regard. Um, uh, um, uh, we've, uh, we have a, 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 a deep expertise within the team. Uh, we've been in the sector um, for, for well over 10 years, um, but it's something that, you know, I think we would talk through with everyone to make sure they understood, um, you know, what that's, what's entailed in that sector um, uh, to see whether people have an appetite for it. Great. Do you just want to quickly do the question around what percentage of your assets are in the UK? And then Lily from Share Action, who I spoke with just a couple of weeks ago, has popped a question in there, um, uh, which I'll let you read and uh, comment on in a moment. But yeah, just on that percentage of the uh, percentage of your assets in the UK versus overseas. Can you just say something on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just before I do, and I'm just reading the question from Lily, it would be useful, just while I answer the, the first question, just to understand in terms of UK regulation, um, just a bit more what you mean by that, Lily. Um, uh, is that is this in respect of um, sustainability? Um, is it kind of subsidies? Um, so is it, is it, if it's regulation, for example, of, of, of renewable energy, um, then we can we can talk about that. Just going uh, in the meantime, um, back to the question about our percentage of assets overseas. Uh, I don't actually have a figure to hand in terms of how our kind of assets under management break down, but in terms of our investments, uh, it's probably around 80 to 85 percent in, in the UK uh, at present. Um, that percentage is, is sort of gradually declining and probably decline a bit more as we do more stuff overseas. Um, what um, so in the UK, we've done a lot of solar, as Elena mentioned, uh, a lot of onshore wind, a lot of bioenergy. Overseas, our main investment programmes have been in Italy, where we've been active since 2008, uh, primarily in solar. Um, we now also have a green bond fund that's focused entirely on Italy. Uh, we have a, a large and growing solar portfolio in Australia. Um, uh, with um, and the, the solar assets in, in Australia, they're, they're, they're far fewer. We've got five assets in Australia compared to uh, sort of over 100, I think, maybe in the UK. They, they tend to be much bigger assets. We've also invested in the US. We invested in US solar. Um, we currently don't have any US solar assets or any US assets because we've just exited a, a portfolio there. Um, but we have um, a, a kind of full range of, um, uh, uh, of track record, as it were, in the US. As a snapshot at the minute, I would say our, um, some of the biggest areas of focus for us are the UK, continuing to be a strong um, focus, both in terms of now starting to invest in unsubsidized renewables. Uh, overseas, it's mostly um, Spain and, and Portugal in terms of um, large unsubsidized solar and the Nordics in terms of, um, uh, in terms of unsubsidized wind. I'll go on now and address the point about um, uh, regulation um, in the UK, and I might be answering the wrong question here, so feel free to correct me. Um, assuming that the, the question is uh, regarding regulation of uh, clean energy um, uh, and other kind of real assets, so the, the, the obviously the big, the big change that's happened in the last few years is that, that, that UK subsidies no longer exist for onshore wind uh, for solar. Uh, the, the UK government continues to push offshore wind in a big way through the CFD um, uh, kind of program. Um, well, what does this mean for us? We are, um, it, it, based on the numbers we have, we think that the onshore wind is not far off being viable on an unsubsidized basis when you look at bigger assets in, um, uh, in Scotland in particular. Um, solar is still some way off. Uh, being um, uh, cost competitive, maybe two years or so. Um, although um, it is possible where you have what are called private wire arrangements, i.e. where you are selling, you're, you're putting solar panels on someone's roof or in their, in their field, essentially selling that power directly to them and avoiding grid cut charges. It's possible um, that, 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 that we're much sooner, we're much closer to that point where solar kind of makes sense, but in those private wire kind of contexts. All of this is generally a good thing for us, um, the move to, towards unsubsidized renewables, uh, because it means that we can do our job as investment managers and just price up assets based on the, the kind of the, the underlying credit of the offtaker, as opposed to having to think about um, uh, kind of subsidies. What we would say is that we think 
it's probably a little bit disappointing the, the kind of lack of support for onshore wind in the UK over the last few years. That seems to be primarily a political decision um, based on um, kind of planning concerns. Um, and when we see the progress that's being made in Finland and Sweden, for example, uh, we would like to see the UK um, kind of helping in this regard um, uh, and maybe easing, for example, planning, um, planning barriers. So, Dan, do you have a load of assets at the moment, say, in the North Sea, where you get a decent feed-in tariff or subsidy? And presumably they've got like 20 year life or something on them. Would they be offering a much greater rate of return than you would on the stuff without the tariffs that you're doing at the moment? Because I see, see in the funded proposition page, it was like 6% return on investment you think you'll get. Do you tend to get more than that on these older assets, which have got a time limited feed in tariff attached to them? Well, it kind of works the other way around, actually, in, in that the, um, uh, the, the, the market. Um, high values um, assets which have feeding tariff contracts because those are low volatility income streams so if you were buying for example a feed-in tariff asset um, in germany a wind asset there you you'd probably be paying uh, five or six percent uh, you would be getting a five or six percent return because the asset price is quite high um, in terms of unsubsidized um, wind when we're doing things on a um, uh, on a greenfield uh, basis, we, we will actually be able to generate uh, probably higher returns, getting closer to double digit um, uh, returns. Um, uh, but that involves taking construction risk. And that's what, not what we're proposing here. Um, we're proposing here operational assets, hence uh, the, the target kind of 6% return. Thanks. Um, I posed the question on the Skype or the chat box, but I'm not sure if everyone's got to it. But I'd be interested to know, uh, we've only got about 10 minutes of this call, but what do you think individually the barriers will be when you, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you are from your sustainability teams in, in the universities, but when you take this to your director of finances and say, why don't we move around down now the off-the-shelf listed equity pot into something a bit more interesting? What do you think will be the barriers? Um, because obviously Foresight and whoever else we work with will be interested to do presentations or come to see you and make pictures and all the rest of it. But um, obviously they, they'll need a, a warm approach facilitating through you as individuals. But what do you think your finance directors would say uh, when you approach them and say, let's move the money out of these list equity pots and something else? See a couple of people are typing. Feel free to come off uh, mute if you want to be more discussive. While we're waiting for those comments to come in, um, Dan and Ellen, do you want to uh, add anything else in? Um, I'm not really sure yet. I'm just conscious of time, so I know we've got kind of 10 minutes left. Um, as Jamie mentioned, that there is a lot more detail in that deck, uh, especially in terms of how we're thinking about the strategy and what that kind of portfolio of assets we think would be most optimal for university would look like. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we'd be very happy to kind of pick this up um, in a follow-on call or you know a meeting where we can kind of dive into the regulation in the in the sectors and the geographies we're proposing in a bit more detail, or indeed uh, provide a bit more insight into our sustainability strategy. I think uh, Henry, who's our in-house kind of sustainability associate has some problems with his microphone. So, so he'd be very happy to kind of give his opinion in terms of the sustainability strategy that he's been rolling out and is now being utilised uh, from a top-down level uh, across the foresight group. Thanks. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments um, about this sort of, the notion of this, this sort of fund or anything generally that I've said or that... Uh, that our, our friends at Foresight have said, now's a chance to either pop in the Skype box or come up and shout it out. So there's a couple of people typing comments again and yeah. just wait patiently to see what comes in. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, there's nobody else typing, then I think we'll leave it there. Can I just ask, I shared the presentation.
can you all, as could it, Grant is my go to person for the technologies working. Have you seen the presentation come through? Sit there. Great. So hopefully you've all downloaded the presentation, but if you haven't got it, just email me and I'll um, send you a copy by email um, by return. Great. So uh, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, everybody, for dialing in. And I'll share this link because it's been recorded uh, with the wider group on the EEC mailbox so that they can tune in as well. Great. Well, well, thank you so much, Jamie, for your help uh, setting up the call. It was really good to get the opportunity to present to all of you. And, and yes, happy to take on any follow-up questions in due course. Great. And it, it, if you don't want to email me for the presentation, just pop it in the chat box now. I'll hang around for a minute or two. And, uh, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.